Hello everybody, welcome to our first lecture in wildland fire ecology. We're going to do uh, an introductory lecture, so uh, we're going to go along with the textbook, the Fire in California Ecosystems uh, textbook, um, pretty much, but uh, I'm going to throw in some extra stuff here and there um, that hopefully will help you uh, better understand what we're talking about. So let's get started. So your uh, your book starts off with this with this quotation where it says in California vegetation is the meeting place of fire and ecosystems. The plants are the fuel and the fire is the driver of vegetation change. Fire and vegetation are often so interactive that they can scarcely be considered separately from each other. And what's really interesting about this is this idea of fire and vegetation being together because um, I'd like to think of it as, as weather and climate, which is something that we're going to, um, get into, uh, a lot, um, in a, in a few weeks where, um, vegetation is almost like looking at, uh, long-term effects of fire, uh, because this landscape is, has been, um, kind of, uh, just, dynamicized by fire the 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 landscape has changed and the landscape has has become a have all these different looks to it because fire is that main driver of change in the ecosystem and the reason that the that our california has all these different ecosystems and all these different looks one of the one of the huge drivers of that is fire and being able to change the fuel types and, and change some of these areas because of the amount that they burn or the amount that they don't burn. And I, I think that that's a really unique relationship that you don't get to see in a lot of places. Now, um, with this class, I've put in a bunch of links, um, but um, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pause your video I'd like you to then go to the lecture notes, click on this link. This one specifically is a TED Ed video, uh, a couple minutes that I'd like you to watch, kind of give you a little introduction on uh, fire ecology. And then once you finish watching that video, come on back. So let's continue on with the lecture. So when we talk about fire, we're talking about a vital dynamic force of nature in um, in any ecosystem that's involved in, but really because we live here, we're going to focus on California. And what's what's really interesting, and we talked about it just on the last slide, is that really the the shape of the the shape, the composition, uh, the structure of the vegetation um, largely is dependent on how um, how much fire is involved in the ecosystem and how how that has changed the ecosystem, whether uh, in pine trees they are um, closed or open cones because um, they need fire or they don't need fire, or um, whether it's a place that needs a lot of understory burns, or whether it's a place that needs huge stand replacing crown burn everything down to the ground type of fires to restart the landscape. It's Fire is a driver of change in the ecosystem. And it's got a huge contribution to the complexities that we see in our ecosystems, as well as the biological diversity, because the idea that you have something coming into the ecosystem all the time and uh, basically knocking some stuff out so that other stuff can come in, that allows for a lot of biological diversity within your system. Change is a good thing in the, in the ecosystem. There is such thing as good fire. This is a really important uh, point for you guys to understand um, because what you hear a lot, you're starting to hear a lot more about the idea that we need to have fire on the landscape and we need to have fire in the ecosystem and we need to use fire because it's important to, to the ecosystem. But you still don't hear it enough because fire, um, in terms of our lives, um, is can be deadly and can be uh, destructive. But fire is a good thing. Fire is necessary for the ecosystem. Fire is the, the driver of change in the ecosystem. And without it, the ecosystem is going to change because ecosystems are dynamic. They're always going to change. But they're going to change in negative ways. And they're going to change in ways that aren't um, going to be good. And they're, 
um, in a lot of cases in California, what happens is you'll just get a lot of fuel buildup because it's just going to wait for fire. And it's going to wait for fire and wait for fire. And then now we've gotten to this era where it's all big, huge mega fires. And people will say, well, how do we stop these huge fires? Why are we having all these huge fires? I'll tell you why we're having all these huge fires. Because what happened is we've just let fuel. We've said no fire, no fire, no fire. When before, even some of these fires, they were just small little understory fires that would have just kind of gotten rid of some of this fuel and gotten rid of some of this fuel. And now that it's all there and there's too many trees and there's too many bushes and now there's all these people living nearby, all of a sudden we get these huge fires and everything becomes a problem. This is a key statement here um, to really get to this good fire thing. We do not have the ability to exclude fire from the ecosystem. That's why it's called fire suppression. We can suppress fire. We can stop some fires when they start, but we cannot keep fire out of the ecosystem. Fire is going to happen one way or another. We just have to decide, do we want little fires or do we want these big, huge mega fires? So the little fires, the ones like in this picture here where they're cleaning, kind of cleaning up the ecosystem, getting rid of some fuel, getting rid of some um, shrubs, allowing for that biodiversity to come in those are good fires those are the types of fires we want and those are the types of fires we should be okay with because having those types of fires prevents us from having big mega fires and it's a really important thing to understand humans need to have a uh or they have a need to manage fire for protection and ecological objectives but we have to adapt our uh, behavior to coexisting with fire. We got to be comfortable with this. I worked in the South for um, for uh, basically a good decade, and fire is just something that you do. It's another tool that you use. It is part of it, and people are okay with it. You drive down the road, you see smoke plumes, and you're like, ah, somebody's doing some prescribed burning today. You never are saying, oh my God, there's a big, huge wildfire. Um, you know, what's going to happen? That's not the thought that happens down in the South. It's just, ah, somebody's using fire today. And we need to kind of get to that different kind of uh, thought process with fire because if we can get there, uh, it's going to really, it'll change the way that we can manage uh, our ecosystem and really allow for, um, to really see kind of the, the ecosystems that we want, the, these, these beautiful uh, hugely diverse, well-functioning ecosystems. Fire is going to be essential to that. So fire as part of part, part of the ecosystem, part of the ecological process. Um, what's, what's really important to understand is that uh, much of California has a Mediterranean climate that is conducive to fire. And so what do we mean by conducive to fire? Well, we have these long, dry summers that have thunderstorm periods in them, low relative humidity, strong winds, everything that is perfect for driving a fire. That's not on accident that that's the climate and that fire has become a, a driving force. Because we have this climate, the fire is perfectly set up to work in this ecosystem. We are the ones who haven't become comfortable with it, but the ecosystem is very comfortable with that. Now we've got to find a way to work with the ecosystem. But if you don't have fires, so between fires, you'll end up with biomass accumulation. And the reason you end up with biomass accumulation is because things grow well here. That's why people planted crops here, because, because the climate's favorable for growth. Things grow well. But what, what you have, if we've got that whole process of something, is we have a period where things grow, so we should have a period where things die. But what happens is because California has such a good climate for growth, we the decomposition period is very short. And so, and if you get into a drought where you don't get that that moistness that you need, then you don't get any decomposition. So things aren't growing going away. So that's how you get fuel accumulating up. So you get things piling up in the forest. Now, decomposition doesn't happen in California just normally anyways. What happens is fire comes in and burns all that stuff out, and that's how we get rid of it. But now we haven't been doing fires, and we don't have the decomposition that we need, 
So you just get stuff building up and building up and building up. And that's how we got into these mega fires that we're at right now that we really want to avoid. I don't know anybody out there who's saying, yes, let's please keep having million acre fires uh, burning through the ecosystem. Nobody wants that. And those type of fires will do some good to the ecosystem. But a lot of those types of fires, if they are ripping and roaring and just blowing through stuff, it's just going to moonscape stuff. And that's not, it'll, it'll help the ecosystem somewhat, but not give it all the ecological benefit that it could. Fire is also a physical process. So it's the idea of it's producing heat. It's got a rate of spread. It's got measurable ecosystem effects. There are both direct and indirect effects of fire, and both of them can be important ecologically. So like an indirect effect of, of fire would be something like um, water quality, where you're saying, well, what does a fire have to do with, with water quality? Well, if fires are coming in there and fire can um, get rid of some, um, plants and not others. Maybe the maybe the plants that burn up really well are plants that have a negative effect and have been you know um, sucking up a bunch of water. Something like salt cedar, for instance, which can you can have salt cedar growing in an area and it might be a wet area and all of a sudden, uh, ten years later, twenty years later, that area is a dry area because those plants can suck up all that water. Well, maybe having a fire go through there. Maybe that gets rid of all the salt cedar, and now all of a sudden we can get water back into that area. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it makes the problem worse. And that's that's the sort of thing where you sit there and you got you really got to think about this ecological process, and you really have to understand. Just because I'm going to sit here and be an advocate for fire and say that we need to use fire as a tool doesn't mean that it solves every problem. I don't tell you to go fix a car and then just hand you a hammer and say, there you go. Figure it out. That's not how it works, right? It's one of the tools in the toolbox. It's one that's going to be useful. A hammer has a lot of uses, but it can't solve every problem. And so we really have to understand the ecosystem, really have to understand how fire works, really have to understand how we can make it work for us. Uh, other things, soil erosion, how fire how a fire can have a, a really negative impact on soil erosion. We saw that a few years ago in Santa Barbara, where we had big fires come through, and then all of a sudden we got rain, and it's like, yeah, we got rain. That's going to take out the fires. And then it was like, no, because then it was nothing but mudslides because all the trees and the, and the shrubs and the roots and all that stuff that was holding the soil in place was all gone, and then we just had huge mudslides. So there there's, can be direct effects, and there can also be indirect effects. You know, what's a direct effect? Oh, well, you know, plant and animal mortality. There were plants here, and there were animals here, and now they're all burned up. That's a pretty direct effect. You know, the amount of smoke produced, I feel like that's a pretty direct effect that a lot of us have had to deal with for the past uh, couple years and just sitting here in, in you know, a couple months' worth of smoke. That's something that you don't want to deal with. Um, but every, all these things are affected by fire. And if we really want to understand fire as an ecological process, we really have to understand the ecosystem, how it fits in the ecosystem, how we fit in the ecosystem, and how we can put all of these things together. And if you say to yourself, that sounds kind of hard and complicated, absolutely. And that's why we haven't just solved the problem right away. It's a complicated problem. It's going to take a lot of time. But we still have to work at it. I'll slide myself down here. All right, so a fire regime. You're going to hear this term often, and so got to make sure that we're comfortable with it. So when you hear the term fire regime, all we're trying to say is it's a complex pattern of fire effects over long periods of time, multiple fire events, and numerous ecosystem properties. Or going back to kind of our simpler, um, our simpler uh, example, weather and climate. If you go outside and you're like, it's sunny today, that is weather. If you say, you know what, I live in Bakersfield and it's sunny like 
the majority of the year every year. Like, it's always going to be super hot in the summer. That's, you're talking about climate there. So if we just say, oh, look at that fire. That fire burned up a ton. Yeah, that's one fire. If we talk about a fire regime, we're talking about, you know, oh, well, we live in the Central Valley and, you know, the we don't really see um, many fires here because of the amount of people uh, living in here and there's not that much space. Whereas um, if we're talking about the uh, the California coast or or the, su- the south coast, we've been seeing a lot of fires there and a lot of these mega fires uh, lately in the south coast area and that's because of uh, the buildup of fuel over time and we start talking about multiple fire events and we start talking about periods of time and we start talking about the different things in the ecosystem those are the things that that play into the fire regime so it's the the pat complex pattern of fire events over a long period of time including multiple events and and the different things in the in the ecosystem and so this picture here so you can talk about space and time. And when we're talking about a regime, you're talking about regions, you're talking about large areas, and then you're talking about decades to centuries, like what happens over a long, long period of time. That's what makes up a fire regime. So if we talk about the fire regime of a certain area, we're talking about um, what we have seen over you know hundreds of years, or the last 50 years, or the last 20 years it's it's long-term patterns you'll also um, in terms of talking about how fire affects uh, the environment there are there's plant and animal adaptations so um, in the background here this is actually a um, longleaf pine uh, seedling and so in in the background of this picture here you'll see that this part right here is green and that's the bud of this plant Um, out on a on a twig or a branch you'll see a bud which is where the the new growth comes from and so you can burn up on this plant you can burn up every bit of it but as long as you don't burn that bud this thing will grow back and this thing will grow back healthy and this thing will grow back vigorous because it loves fire. It needs fire. It loves to have fire to grow just as long as you don't burn this guy, which means you can burn the crap out of this plant. That This tree is like a 100-foot tall tree. You can burn 80% of this tree, 90% of this tree. You don't burn these guys up. The tree's perfectly fine. And so... Why tell you about that? There are species that have evolved to tolerate or require fire in order to complete their life cycles. Some of it just flat out need it. Um, we'll talk about serotonous cones at some point in time, when all that means is that the, the cone is closed, and when it gets fire and it gets heated up enough, it's like popcorn. It opens up, and all of the seeds come out, and then the the area can basically replant itself because all the seeds go into this wide open ground because all the trees have been burned down and all the cones have popped open. And that plays into uh, an ecosystem feedback loop, a continuous feedback loop where basically the fire feeds on the vegetation and then the vegetation will then need fire to help maintain its site and its growth and, you know, open up pockets in certain areas or in the case of... um, longleaf pine and some other species really to help it grow i did a burn in georgia where we um burned on a on a not great burn day and so some areas burned and some areas didn't and when we came back to that same property a couple years later what we found is the areas that didn't get fire that day they were doing okay the areas that had fire that day the trees had already shot up and were like twice as tall as the other tea as the other trees because Some of these areas, some of these plants, some of these um, species are really adapted and and need fire to help them grow and help them um, maintain their their site and and just make their life easier. Um, Animals also um, are used to this process. And so one of the things I think, um, and we'll talk about it a little bit later when we talk about Bambi 
these other things is people think about like, oh, if a forest fire happens, like all the animals are going to die. And the animals are used to it. The animals have been around um, in some of these areas longer than we have. And they understand, like, if this is an area where the fire, you're going to see a lot of animals who have adapted to become uh, burrowing animals. Because to avoid what's happening on the surface, you only have to get like eight inches into the ground. The snakes aren't going to die, the the voles, the mice, all these things, they're not going to die because they're just going to go underground for a little bit and they're going to be fine. The uh, the the larger game, the deers, the the bears, that sort of stuff, they kind of they'll live in different areas that that don't involve them having to go running from fire all the time, um, and that's where you get this the distribution of species can be driven by patterns of fire and vegetation. Like would um, would elk love to just hang out in the grasslands of the Central Valley? Sure, they would, but they need it to be a little bit colder, and they definitely don't want to have to go running from fire all the time. So they've adapted to live at higher elevations, and they have a you know a little thicker coat so that they can live at higher elevations. So it's little things like that that you might not think of as being um, part of understanding fire and vegetation, but it's it all plays together because it's all part of one. Um, one ecosystem or many ecosystems that then become one ecosystem. So some of the ideas um, in terms of functional traits for fire dependent plant communities. So bark thickness. So you'll have some trees that have thin bark and those trees will be sensitive to fire. You'll have some that have thick bark and they're adapted to, um, to fire. A great example of that is uh, redwood trees and giant sequoia trees really thick bark because they don't want to get burned they 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 know like i just need to make sure that you know you don't get to my inner cambium layer and and i'll be fine plant height right if you're if you're shorter you're okay with getting burned up every once in a while if you're um up high you don't want that part to get burned up as much so why do trees look the way they do why do you know, you have branches going all the way up, and why does one tree become 100 feet tall and one tree become only like 50 feet tall? Part of it is um, is how they're adapted to grow, what site they're in. Another part of it is do they want, um, in, at least in California and these other fire-dependent plant communities, do they want to get burned up in fire, or is there part of the tree that doesn't want to get burned up in fire? Uh, in terms of being an angiosperm or broadleaf or gymnosperm, being a conifer, some of most of the angiosperms are fire sensitive. Most of the gymnosperms are fire adapted. And then in terms of fire vulnerability, if they've got high vulnerability, they're sensitive. If they got low vulnerability, they're fire adapted. So it's really interesting to start just looking at um, the different species out in the ecosystem and, and saying, how does this fit in? If a fire was to come through here, what would burn up and why? And would it burn up in all fires? Does it have to be a big raging fire to burn up? Or if it was just this little like fire with two foot flame lengths, would it burn up? These are all the kind of questions you have to ask yourself as you think about um, fire and how it fits into the ecosystem. In terms of uh, ecosystems uh, in California, we have, um, or at least what this book and, and a couple other people um, have done, is broken California up into bioregions. So this is a map of the bioregions that they have uh, broken it up into. So you can see Bakersfield is all, is down here at the bottom of the Central Valley, so we really fit into this um into the Central Valley uh, bioregion. There's also the Sierra Nevada bioregion. You see how the Sierra Nevada kind of um, comes around there. So if you're a somebody who lives in Tehachapi, you're not going to fall in the Central Valley bioregion. You really fall more into the Sierra Nevada uh, bioregion. This South Coast here uh, bioregion, that's really if you, um, once you get to the grapevine and you hit those transverse mountains, uh, mountain ranges, and what do we mean by transverse mountain ranges? Well, if I'm go if I'm driving on 99 heading south towards the grapevine, I see that mountains are coming from the west and going towards the east. Those are the transverse 
mountain ranges. And so that's that's this south coast biome. Central coast, it goes all the way from the Bay Area down to, um, you know, Santa Barbara and um, everything kind of north of, like, the the Transverse Mountains and the, the um, you know, like Santa Monica Mountains, those sort of things. Um, so San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Monterey, Santa Cruz, all of that fits into the, the Central Coast next to us. Um, but the state's divided into nine bioregions, um, and... Uh, really about 54% of California is uh, fire-maintained vegetation types. You're not going to get a lot of fires um, up on the on the north coast, and you, you're not going to get um, a lot of fires in the desert because you just don't have a lot of vegetation to burn, but you'll get a lot of fire in, you know, more than half of these acres that we have available in these, uh, in these bioregions. Why divide the state up into these bioregions? I think um, the the best reason is just simplification. To be able to uh, break it down and um, take the kind of separate out the ecosystems to really be able to say like this is what's more important here as opposed to there. And so having knowledge of how fire operates in each of these uh, regions is going to make it easier to manage and to conserve and really um, get a greater working knowledge of fire on the landscape in these areas. So um, this is another part where I've got a link right here to a YouTube video. So go ahead and press pause and uh, go into the lecture notes and click on that link and watch that video. So in terms of Californians and fire, so it's really important for us to just understand that fire is the driving force behind human-induced vegetation change. And that's what the, the video um, with Scott Stevens, who's a professor up at Ber UC Berkeley, um, really focuses on. Um, we do know uh, just by looking at, at evidence and, and understanding the landscape that Native Americans had... Um, had fire as a tool and used it uh, in their management of the landscape for the things that they um, that they found important. Now um, the landscape then didn't change much until the Euro-American settlers came in and what happened is um, with that that word settler people came in and settled and didn't want to live nomadic lives, didn't want to use fire, saw it, didn't um, provide that ecological disturbance, and um, then California started shifting. And that becomes important because that's that's what we've seen lately, is this idea of getting settled and um, kind of spreading out and less and less of, of this management of fire. And so now we're just going to kind of, um, I want to kind of backtrack a little bit and just kind of go into because that's that's where the book takes you is is kind of that idea but i want to give you a little more like western u.s fire history to really um kind of paint this picture a little bit more about about the different eras and and kind of how things went in terms of fire history all right i'll be over here looking over the shoulder of this uh, nice grizzly bear. So um, before human settlement, uh, before even like uh, Native Americans and all of that, you know, like 12,000 years ago, the fire regimes um, were dependent on fuel built up, and then you'd have ignition by lightning, and that's how the kind of the landscape just worked without people being involved. And so there was different looking vegetation back then. This picture here is actually a um, rendering of, of what kind of California looked like before uh, people. This is, uh, I believe this is supposed to be the San Fernando Valley out here. You might look at this and go, is that supposed to be Baker Bakersfield and this is Windwolves? No, this is supposed to be like the San Fernando Valley, that thing that has like millions of people in it now and a bunch of homes. That's what this is what that looked like, you know, 12,000 years ago. Much different um, than what we see today because of human influence. 
So if you want to uh, pause the video once again, I've got this link right here that you can click on and check that out. So then we get to the Native American era. So we get um, we get human beings um, involved. They want to manipulate the vegetation for resource need. And fire is just the most effective, efficient, and widely employed management tool because they're not worried about like, well, if I light the forest on fire, what is Fred and his wife going to go think about it? No, because there's not, there's not any other people for, for miles and miles and miles. So they could, they could do big burns if necessary. They could do little burns to clear off areas. And if you say, well, how do we know that? And what could possibly tell us that? It's being able, um, really to actually look at what we see nowadays in terms of the landscape and see what we thought of as natural before that and really to tell us um, how the landscape was being managed. So um, a good place to see this is Yosemite National Park because people looked at Yosemite National Park in the you know early 1900s and they're like look at this place this place is beautiful it's so pristine we can't have any we can't do anything here we we got to just keep this as beautiful as it is because it looks perfect but as as time has gone on in Yosemite National Park we see the encroachment of some of these um um conifer trees and we're losing less and less valley space and um, we start seeing some of these problems that have that are happening over the last 20 30 years and it's because we had stopped using things like fire the 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 native americans who lived in in that area were using fire and we're managing the landscape the landscape there's this big myth um in terms of preservation and conservation where people think oh we got to preserve this area we got to keep it the way it looks and we got to keep it pristine and we just got to keep people away from it because that's just the way nature has made it nature gives you a starting point but to get it to look the way that you want it to you have to you have to manage it and so when you see stuff like this old drawings like this it might be that there was just a valley right here but wouldn't it make more sense that if this area that they settled in, um, you know, that they actually did some work to make this the area that they settled in rather than just like, oh, yeah, there was, you know, there just happened to be this big, wide open valley. And so we settled there. I'm sure that happens in some places. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen everywhere, but maybe this was the valley, right? And then maybe they've burned off all this extra area so that that you know the tribe could become bigger and they'd have more area to spread out on and so it's really important to think about people using fire as a tool um the estimates are between 5 to 13 million acres burned annually so one of the things that people say which is kind of a, a misunderstood idea is that they say there's so many acres being burned nowadays. There used to be a lot of acres burned in the past too. It's just there weren't, you know, millions and millions of people and millions and millions of homes to worry about. That's the big difference. There used to be plenty of burning happening from, from fires, but people are so spread out now and people have, um, are in all these different areas that's a lot harder to let 13 million acres burn a year that's just not going to happen but we can try and get as close as we can um, so really it's for me the big thing with the Native American era to understand is that that people were using fire people saw it as being useful. They didn't have a lot of tools, but they, this was one of them and they used it. So now we get the, um, the era of Euro, uh, American settlement and Asian American settlement. Um, and we start getting type conversion. So if you want to click here, um, the park service talks about, um, it's a little PDF about type conversion. So you can pause this and check that out. 
but really what happens is we we go from like these um nomadic tribes and um really managing the landscape with fire to um now having these different purposes mining you know the whole gold rush and everything livestock farming and so we have all these different tools and so fire doesn't become a tool anymore and because of our relationship with the native americans where they get displaced we don't um we didn't talk to them and learn from them and learn about their ways they just these are people who came from other areas and brought their ideas and their their tools in um and then created these these more cityscapes and the beginnings of what we're more used to now and because of that you start getting because you don't get fires um anymore you start getting species composition changes you start getting the invasion of non-native plants because people didn't know any better so if you traveled from one area to an another they didn't understand that you know if seeds or things get stuck to them that that might be problematic and so um, it really it really begins to basically um, you know convert these areas from from one um, from one idea to another these are no longer just um, a forest with a with a grassy valley and some human beings in it there's now a this area is a settled a settlement and then outside of that area is a forest um, you know with valleys or mountains or whatever and invasive plants really start to become um, problematic they are a huge out of control problem now but this is where we start um, to see the beginnings of that problem